All right, um, we'll get started. So welcome to the first in a new series, uh, Wise Words, a deep dive into contemplative science. This is hosted by the Contemplative Studies Center at the University of Melbourne. I'm Nicholas Van Dam. I'm the director of the center. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. I'd also like to pay respects to elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to all indigenous Australians who may be present today. Today, we're joined by Matthew Sharp, Associate Professor at Philosophy at Deakin University. He's the author of academic and general publications across different areas of study, and is increasingly in the last decade published on the idea of philosophy as a, as a way of life, central to the works of French scholars, Pierre and Illustrat Hadot, if I hope I, hope I pronounced those correctly, um, close enough. Um, <laughs> Focusing on the Stoic tradition, his 2021 Bloomsbury book, Philosophy as a Way of Life, History, Dimensions, Directions, co-authored with Michael Ure, Your, yep. Your, uh, attempts the first systematic study of this conception of philosophy in the West, which integrates therapeutic, aesthetic, and contemplative, as well as rational dimensions. He is also active in the modern Stoic community, including in co-organizing the 2022 Melbourne Stoicon X event in February of this year. Matt's presentation will explore conceptions of contemplation and contemplative life in ancient Greek and Roman thought. Um, if you do have any questions, please post them in the Q&A at any stage. Um, at the end of Matt's presentation, I'll pop back on and, and we'll start going through those questions, um, but feel free to post them throughout the talk um, and we'll address as many of them as we possibly can. Um, so welcome, Matt, uh, to, the, to the, the series and um, thanks for your time and everyone, I hope you enjoy. Thank you, Nicholas, and thanks to the centre. Um, it's terrific to be here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen, which has, um, which will have some slides with um, just some key quotes. So hopefully people should be beginning to see what I'm seeing. Okay. Can, uh, can I just quickly confirm with you, Nicholas, and others, um, whether that's... Yes, we can see the slide. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So um, to undertake to give even a working survey of conceptions of contemplation in Greek and Roman philosophy is a difficult task. Um, not only is it going to involve potentially spanning um, eight or nine centuries of, of complex philosophical thought in a period of um, quite striking cultural transformation. But today's predominant understandings of philosophy would, I guess, in some ways seem to militate against or, or push against the idea that uh, philosophy as philosophy could have anything much to do with contemplation. So I want to begin by, by, by raising this and, and taking you, as it were, on a bit of a journey from this kind of potential hesitation about the very idea of what I'm doing to hopefully uh, a fairly robust de defense of, of the centrality of conceptions of, con uh, of, of contemplation in Greek and Roman philosophy. Okay, the 20th century indeed saw many powerful challenges to the idea that philosophy just is, I guess, rational argumentation, which has nothing to do with the subjective states of the inquirer, a model in which, of course, one could, as it were, correctly reason in a rage or with perfect serenity. It just doesn't matter. In terms of understandings of ancient philosophy, the textual record, I think, doesn't easily support the idea that ancient pagan philosophers talk of contemplation. The key word here is theoria or meditation, melite is a phenomenon that we could readily quarantine away from serious philosophy. So as um, Jacob H. Sherman has written in his book on contemplation and philosophy, the importance of the Western contemplative tradition, as you can see from reading the quote, to the practice of philosophy in the ancient and antique worlds can hardly be overstated, he says. Even if you've just got a passing acquaintance with these, these traditions, You'll see, he, he argues, how predominant the language of theoria in the Greek or the Latin's referencing contemplatio actually is. Moreover, 
in Plato, but I think also in other thinkers like Aristotle, theory as a form of activity, contemplation, is pointed out as being distinctly philosophical. That is, contemplation is something that philosophers would do specifically when they're being philosophers, uh, as against uh, in any other role or capacity they might be, be taking up. So this can make us wonder, I think, whether what is at issue in ongoing attempts to segregate philosophy from contemplation is, as it were, more about us than it is perhaps about the texts of the past. Now, certainly that's the kind of position that I'm going to, to be arguing here. And I take it that it is um, potentially a controversial one. So obviously I've got some work to do with you. So let's begin by looking at some of the, the classical texts to better frame the discussion. In Plato's Republic, which is pretty much as canonical as you're going to get, if we're talking Western philosophy, we're told that the philosopher, and you can see this is number one, would hold on his way. Um, of course, the male pronouns here are unavoidable because they're textual, till he came into touch with the nature of each thing in itself by that part of his soul to which it belongs to lay hold of that kind of reality. And through that approaching it and uh, it and consorting with reality, really to ontos ontos, he would beget intelligence and truth. Let me skip to number three due to time. You can look at two um, as, as we go in the Timaeus, which is arguably the most uh, preeminent of the cosmological dialogues, the dialogues about how the cosmos holds together. We're told that the philosopher who has seriously devoted himself to learning and true thoughts and has exercised these qualities above all his others must necessarily and inevitably think thoughts that are immortal and divine, undying and divine. And insofar as it is possible for human nature to partake of not dying immortality, he must fall short thereof in no degree. And inasmuch as he is forever tending his divine part and duly magnifying that daemon or spirit who, which dwells along with him, he must be supremely blessed. So you can see this is quite something. We don't really have to wonder very hard how such passages alongside others in other Platonic texts would come to inform later Neoplatonic uh, mysticism, as well as the Christian contemplative traditions. Nevertheless, um, such features, um, Platonic features seemingly, uh, when it comes to contemplation, um, can be found, I would argue, and are found not simply in Plato, but when we turn to perhaps seemingly the most secular of the, the philosophers and often the, the ancient philosophy is pointed to as most, as it were, like us, that is Aristotle. And here's a passage, a very famous passage indeed, from the Nicomachean Ethics book 10, chapter seven, when Aristotle is again talking about theory or contemplation. And he writes in the terms that you can see there that the activity of the intellect or of the intuition of noose is felt to excel in serious worth all others because it consists in contemplation and to aim at no end beyond itself and to also contain a pleasure peculiar to itself. And if accordingly the attributes of this activity are found to be self-sufficiency, leisuredness, I'll return to that, such freedom from fatigue as is possible and all the other attributes of blessedness, it follows that it is the activity of the intellect that constitutes complete human happiness. Such a life as this, however, will be higher than the human level, not in virtue of his humanity will a person achieve it, but in virtue, again, of something within him that is divine. If then the intellect is something divine in comparison with man, so is the life of the intellect divine in comparison with human life. And we ought so far as possible to achieve immortality and to do all that we can to live in accordance with the highest thing of all, the highest thing in us. <clears throat> So a critic might, of course, hold out still at this point and say, well, this is just Aristotle and Plato, albeit on most reckonings, uh, a fairly central chapter in any, any text on ancient philosophy. So let me produce two more passages from another tradition that tends to be read as, um, and for, for good reasons, in, in a sense, as, as certainly materialistic and as therefore kind of more secular, I guess, um, and perhaps closer in that sense to what we might understand by philosophy. So. These are two passages now from the Stoics. We've done, had a look at the Platonic text. We've had a look at some uh, a very famous Aristotelian text. And here we look at 
a text from the second scholarch of the um, Stoic school found in the fourth century. This is a passage from Cleanthes of Assos. It's his famous hymn to Zeus. So it's a philosopher writing a hymn. And you can see that the, the language is indeed reflective of, um, of, of what we would expect from a hymn in, in other traditions with which we might be more familiar. He addresses Zeus as the most honored of immortals um, and praises him for the law by which he rules the cosmos, directing with this koinon logon, universal reason, pervading all things, um, joining them into one, I'm halfway down the quote, the good and the bad, they all share in a single unified everlasting reason or logos, neither mortals nor gods have any greater privilege then than to make everlasting song of the universal law in justice. So again, um, a passage that would suggest that perhaps our contemporary understandings of the range of speech acts that philosophers could undertake and the range of conceptions of what it is that we're doing as philosophers seems to be rather stretched relative to our contemporary understanding. Let's take a look finally some centuries later at a Roman Stoic to give this a bit of a, a, a temporal stretch as well. It's not just the earlier um, philosophical phenomena, um, but Seneca is a first century CE figure, um, as, as people will know. And in his book, The Natural Questions, um, he describes the goal of studying the natural world. So what we would call physics, uh, again, in strikingly, I, I believe, contemplative terms that you can see there, he says the full consummation of human felicity um, is attained when all vice trampled underfoot, the soul seeks the heights and reaches the inner recesses of nature. What joy then to roam through the very stars, to look down with derision or scorn on the gilded, gilded salons of the rich and the whole earth. Only when one has surveyed the whole universe can one truly despise grand colonnades, ceilings glittering with ivory, trim grows, and cooling streams transported into wealthy ma mansions. From above, one can now look down upon this narrow world, and so on. Even armies um, traversing borders with which we're still familiar today will appear to you as little more significant than as a swarm of ants. That is a mere point in which you sail in war and dispose your kingdoms. So my contention would be, my starting contention to you today would be that even this small sample of ancient Greek and Roman philosophical writings and larger sections could be given, selections, alerts us to the possibility that the ways we understand reasoning, which is what philosophers do as against, I guess, religious or not philosophical experiences like contemplation were not simply shared by our predecessors. Again, Sherman in Partakers of the Divine gives us this definition of generic contemplation, which um, I'm going to, as it were, hold constant for purposes of the discussion. It's a form of human activity involving the exercise of sustained attention, the cultivation of awareness leading to states of subjective expansion, wonder, tranquility, illumination, or communion. So what could any of this have to do with the reasoning of philosophers? Of course, we suppose today, those of us who are in the trade, that thinking clearly and critically about the world, which is ideally what we're training people to do, could lead them to transformed understandings of the world. One student goes to university and becomes a convinced liberal, another a convinced Marxist or a Deleuzean and so on. Nevertheless, such intellectual conversions, we don't tend to suppose could involve any larger existential transformation, or if they happen to, we might suppose that this is no longer a philosophical, but perhaps a psychological or ideological matter. It's as if we suppose that to reason clearly and consistent, consistently, seeking out the natures and causes of things and their relations couldn't enable us, couldn't enable us to better connect to and so feel more at home in the world that our reasonings would describe. Rather, our reasoning can only abstract us from the real stuff of experience. Hence, we suppose any lived sense of connection with or belonging within the world 
would have to be irrational or subjective, not reasonable or philosophical. But for the ancient Greek and Roman philosophers, I believe this sense of reasoning in Greek logismos, in Latin ratio senatio, had not yet acquired this kind of abstracting characteristic that we, I think, mostly attribute to it today or can often attribute to it today. Consider this definition from Marcus Tullius Cicero's De Officius, Book 1, 11. Uh, this is number seven. In contrast to other animals, Cicero says, a human, because she is a participant in reason, already an interesting phrase, through which she assesses outcomes, sees the causes and development of things, not ignoring the relevant background, makes analogies between similar things, adds in the current situation, ties it in with the future. She easily surveys the whole course of life and makes the required preparations for going forward. So reason ratio here does not, as if from outside the world, posit the causes it discovers, nor does it create as if from nothing the analogies it discerns. It allows a person to see these with what we might call their mental eye. Again, in understanding the connection between present and future, this reason doesn't coldly subtract from the fullness of present reality. It rather grasps this present more richly and truly by allowing the person to frame it within a synoptic view of the whole, which allows a person to reframe their immediate experiences. Such a view of reason, developing a kind of increasingly synoptic, that is one vision, sense of the whole, the whole of life, or ultimately the whole of nature, is what we might call a connective, as well as an elevating activity. It elevates humans above other sentient species of which we know. As Cicero writes in passage eight, the famous hymn to humanity in the laws, while nature has debased the forms of other animals, and we might not agree with Cicero's assessment of, of that particular matter, but anyway, the, the, the contrast is what matters here, who live to eat rather than eat to live. She has bestowed on, on man, and again, the, the male is in the text, an erect stature and an open countenance, and thus prompted him to contemplatio of heaven, the ancient home of his kindred immortals. So reasoning for the ancient philosophers fosters in us the capacity to feel connected with the world and with others rather than strangers always responding to particular situations and experiences without any sense of their wider place and value. At the same time, we connect together in our reasoning experiences and phenomena which might otherwise strike us as wholly singular or inexplicable. It will be a question that is of seeking out the basic principles of things and their interconnections under such headings as that of the cosmic logos, which we saw Cleanthes, the Stoic hymning, or the Platonic ideas, or Aristotle's archive, that is the first principles. Such formative principles in turn, rightly occasion in inquirers attitudes akin to what we might term reverence, or in um, Sherman's words, states of subjective expansion or wonder. For these highest things, the ideas, the Logos with a capital L, the Platonic ideas, the first principles, give form to everything that makes possible our own experiences. So far indeed is our reasoning from separating us from the world. For the Stoics, for instance, that each of our Logoi, that is our capacities to speak and reason, are presented as fragments of the cosmic Logos, capital L. Our philosophizing on such a model is our attempt to reflectively harmonize our little logos with this great capital L cosmic logos and as such to live in harmony homo logumenos with the same logos as nature. Um, thesis. So we'll return to this orienting thought because I think in the end it's such such ideas that I think that are absolutely at the basis of, of, of how contemplation is conceived as philosophical. Okay. So that's the most difficult part of the paper um, conceptually. Um, I think it's important though to, to, to get a sense of how uh, for the ancient philosophers reasoning seems to be there to allow us to progressively approach ever closer mirrorings or sinkings up of our mind's eyes with the larger whole of interconnected causes, a whole of which we in turn are one part. 
And if this holds, then our tendency today to sharply divide between reasoning and anything like contemplation becomes difficult to uphold. Our theories represent not cold abstractions. They are attempts at theorine, that is, in the Greek, a form of seeing as at a religious festival of things which are usually hidden, but which speak to the highest or the most important dimensions of existence, the truths of nature, of human nature, and of the intelligibility of the whole. By connecting us to these larger truths, which it enables us to contemplate, philosophy ultimately enables enhanced forms of self-knowledge, answering to Socrates' directive to Gnothi Siaton, know yourself. So rather than understanding Greek and Roman philosophy as a simple break with pre-Socratic or pre-philosophical religious or cultural forms, it seems to me that it's more productive to see ancient philosophy as a process of secularization. Drawing on several articles by the aforementioned Pierre Hadot, what is at play in this philosophy is not an attempt to simply desacralize the world, replacing forms of participatory experience with the sobering separation afforded by detaching analytic reason. What is at stake is a kind of reconception of the sacred. In Greek and Roman pre-philosophical religions, the sacred was confined to specific locations, the temples of the contemplatio, and also to designated sacred times. Pilgrims would travel to sanctuaries like Eleusis, Delphi, or Delos on specified occasions in order to commune with the gods and experience a break with the ordinary preoccupations of their everyday lives. However, says Hado, in this need to go to distant places in order to find happiness or strong emotions, the philosophers identify the symptom of an inner uneasiness. A true happiness, according to the ancient philosopher, is not found in the places which we visit to change scenery, but in inner displacement, that is, in the spiritual transformation, which brings peace of mind and a new way of seeing the world. So philosophy, you can see in this perspective, emerges as a project to assist people to change their souls, not their geography. And quote, the next quote, the Stoics and Platonists invite us to change our soul rather than to change locations. It's not necessary to voyage to the ends of the world to see wonders. It suffices to open one's eyes to contemplate the totality of the universe, the sun, the moon, the stars and the earth. For the philosophers, that is, the cosmos as a whole and its ordering principles becomes the highest object of theoria or contemplation. Its formative or evoking powers are not concentrated in any one place or sanctuary, let alone in the statue of an anthropomorphized deity. Its wonders are no longer to be disclosed through forms of ritual piety, but through forms of observant reasoning. Quote Hado again, the cosmos is at the same time the place proper to man, citizen of the world, and the soul sacred place, a temple which is not made by the hands of man, which the divinity inhabits. Man passes his life there, and this is why every day is a festival, the sole true festival, for those who know how to comprehend the splendor of existence. Okay, so that's three of the five parts done, if you're wondering whereabouts we are. And I think I'm roughly a little bit over 20 minutes in, so I think I'm going to make it on time. What are the features? Um, let's drill in a little bit so how contemplation or theoria contemplatio the soul true festival for the philosopher and so on how is it situated and conceived in the philosophical text the image that is on the screen aims to show how conceptions of contemplation in the greek and roman philosophers were enucleated if you like by a series of cognate uh, divergent but intersecting considerations and subjects of discussion Firstly, there is an argument from human nature, which we glimpsed in Cicero's texts above, and it also operates in the text of Aristotle that I quoted above. We are, as it were, according to this idea, made by nature or the gods to be able to contemplate. Um, so I'll come back to that diagram, but here's, here's the next quote, which comes from Seneca's text of leisure. Nature has given us a curious temperament and conscious of its own skill and beauty has made us the viewers of such great and spectacular things. For nature would lose the pleasure of itself if so great, brilliant and finely wrought, so shining and so diversely beautiful things were displayed in solitude. In order to know that 
that it wanted to be gazed upon and not merely glanced at, it has placed humans in, in the central part of itself and given us a surrounding view of everything. It has not just made man upright, but also intending to make him fit for contemplation so that he can follow the gliding constellations and spread his gaze around the whole thing. It has made an uplifted head for him and placed it on a flexible neck. So this contemplative capacity is, is given to us by nature. To fulfill that nature, we would need to fulfill this um, capacity as well. It features also this capacity in ancient discourses surrounding the best form of life, which I want to single out. So there's a whole series of texts on what's the best way of life, a life of leisure or a life of activity, typically politically activity. The life of leisure, scholia, contrasted with that of the political man, the bios uh, practicos or bios politicos. As Ar Aristotle makes clear in, in the passage cited above from the Nicomachean Ethics, a distinctly contemplative life requires leisure. He's even capable of arguing that this leisured aspect attests to its greater self-sufficiency and value relative to a life in which more active virtues predominate. However, as Margaret Graver, a, a very important Stoic scholar, has explored with direct reference to Seneca's text of leisure, which I quoted just now, it is nevertheless important to acknowledge that there are different forms of leisured or non-active life at issue in these debates. What we would directly recognise as contemplation of natural or metaphysical truths often takes an unclear secondary or sometimes wholly absent place behind exercises of ethical self-cultivation. These spiritual exercises like practices in moderating the passions promise the cultivation of kinds of inner tranquility there's a host of different words in these languages that will describe um, cognate states of inner serenity or tranquility, apatheia, ataraxia, euthymia, or in Latin, tranquillitas, serenitas. Um, but the point I want to make is that when the defense of the leisured life takes place, it doesn't always mean the same as the defense of the specifically contemplative life. There are other practices that the leisured person can do, which are also going to produce tranquility. However, however, Contemplative activity also, also is celebrated precisely for its capacity, um, not simply as leisured, but its capacity to engender forms of tranquility. So Epicurus, a materialistic philosopher, nevertheless goes so far as to underscore that as far as he's concerned, the entire point of physics, natural philosophy, resides in how understanding how the natural world works engenders inner tranquility because it dispels, in his view, empty opinions concerning the gods, the afterlife, natural disasters, dreams, immortality, erotic love, and what we need and need to avoid in order to live well. So even within this tradition of Epicureanism, atomistic, materialistic, um, we have a, the idea that developing a philosophical perspective involves a kind of contemplative conversion away from ordinary ways of seeing the world uh, and, and with those ways of seeing the world, the forms of avoidable hurry and suffering that they typically involve us in. Now, this conversion, I think, in all of the philosophical schools uh, is linked to the development of an enlarged contemplative understanding, or what Pierre Hadot again calls a conscience cosmique in French, a consciousness of the whole, roughly speaking. Its ideal instantiation is the figure of the sage, the fully wise person, who has knowledge of things human and divine and lives according to that, that wisdom. The inner life of such a figure, all the different schools agree, is more akin to the regular untroubled movement of the heavenly bodies, which she contemplates and admires, than the scattered uneasiness which characterises ordinary people's psychologies here below. So this contemplative awareness of the sage is closely associated across the different ancient schools with de depictions of and directions concerning certain contemplative activities. One of these, which I'll mention, and only one because of time, is what's uh, known, uh, or has become known in the last decades as the view from above down on human affairs. So you can see Marcus Aurelius meditating to himself here, that it's a fine saying of Plato that he who is thinking about men, discoursing about men should look at, at earthly things as if he viewed them from some higher place. We saw this with Seneca's natural questions should look down upon their assemblies, armies, and so on and so forth, and re-see them as a mixture of things and an orderly, orderly combination of contraries. 
So the effect of such an exercise is precisely to reframe ordinary sources of concern, which as it were, fix us within our present preoccupations. The view from above contemplative exercises, exercise aims to push against the ways in which immersion in the concerns of daily life closes us off from larger realities within whose perspective each of these smaller events appears truly minuscule in space, transient in time, and utterly common rather than singular, striking or overwhelming. Cultivating a contemplative view from above or from the perspective of eternity, subspecie eternitatis, by contrast allows the philosopher to see ordinary affairs as less worthy of the distress and trouble that they might otherwise occasion in the soul. So at this point, I'm at the last part of my paper, um, and I think I have about eight or nine minutes, so I'm going to make it. I'll give you a little bit of a summary because I've sort of rapid fired uh, through quite a, quite a lot of content. We started by staging the view that ancient philosophies couldn't have been contemplative because we know today that philosophy involves forms of reasoning which are foreign to such experiences. By citing just a small sample from across three ancient schools, I call, well, this paper has called this certainty into question. Then it challenged the supposition that the Greeks and Romans conceptions of reasoning must have been the same as ours, stressing the way that the ancient philosophers rather saw this capacity as our most divine or godlike because of it being a means to harmonize ourselves with the larger whole, not as a kind of abstracting, calculating, distancing capacity, which alienates us from our surrounds. This excursion into first philosophy provided the setting for a cultural historical claim that Greek and Roman philosophy didn't so much break with earlier forms of culture and experience we consider religious as operate a rationalization of the sacred from external temples to within the souls of inquirers and seekers after wisdom. We then examined how ancient philosophic contemplation was configured in relation to celebrations of the leisured life. This relationship is a little bit complex. A member of the male elite could withdraw from public affairs and cultivate tranquility without doing contemplative stuff. However, leisure was recognized as a precondition for theoria and in Aristotle celebrated as being the most leisured form of human activity. Moreover, in all of the philosophical schools, excepting the skeptics, developing an understanding of physics or metaphysics, which would enable the philosopher to envisage with their mind's eye, the generative principles and interconnection of the parts of the whole, this was held to produce tranquility. Philosophizing was held to produce tranquility. Such an expanded philosophical purview relativizes ordinary anxiety inducing attachments or as Marcus Aurelius says somewhere cleansing away the mire of terrestrial life of course that's in translation so I want to close now by returning to what I flagged as potentially I think the key idea in getting to the bottom of this um, I termed it the connective sense of reasoning in the ancient philosophers because I think this is really, really decisive if we can get a handle on this. And I, I confess that I'm, 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 I'm you know, still working at it. In an important brief encyclopedia article on ancient conceptions of conversion, um, Pierre Hadot, whom I've mentioned several times, begins by underscoring how this notion of conversion, which sounds solely subjective to us, it's a person who has to convert for us, like St. Paul on the road to Damascus, but Haddo argues that in Platonism and, and, and Stoicism, the ancient philosophical schools, conversion had a prior sense, a more objective sense. As he writes, <clears throat> what's it is? Strephine, which is the, the Greek word at issue in um, conversio in Latin conversion, um, at least it's the root of many of the words, used to designate the perfect movement, that is circular movement. Plato employs words of the family of Strephon. This perfect movement is proper to the gods, the heavens and the world. So there it is, it's out there because it is the movement proper to the intellect and reflection. According to the Stoics, the circular movement is constitutive of all substantial reality. The words from the family of Strephon serve to designate the movement of return towards the center or towards the interior which according to the doctrine of tonic movement a stoic physical doctrine gives to all substance its cohesion 
cohesion, being, and unity in all things thus results from epistrophe and conversion towards the interior. So in this configuration, the conversion of an individual away from immersion in their partial, egoistic, non-philosophical ways of living towards a more philosophical, enlarged sense of their place in the whole would mirror or in fact instantiate the larger cosmic process. And that's the, the mind bend, right? In Neoplatonism, you can encounter a kind of ontological trinity of being, life, thought, which of course is going to make its way into another Trinitarian tradition. In it, being is conceived of as externalizing itself in life before returning to itself in thought. In this cosmology, human thought, which seeks understanding of the structure and principles of being, does not simply look to return to this being as it were from outside, the philosophical search again instantiates the larger movement of reality itself. Just as in the Stoics, my individual logos is not properly speaking maths distinctly. Uh, it's not distinctly a holy mind. It is rather, as Epictetus chastises us, a piece of the cosmic logos which Zeus has given us for about 70 years as if on loan. And our job is to try to return it back to Zeus in good condition. Um, it's with reference to this deconstruction of the subjective objective division in classical pagan philosophies that I believe the place of contemplation in ancient pagan philosophical thought can best be approached. As in later understandings of contemplation, what is at stake is on one side a form of knowledge which takes realities larger than and other to the individual as its objects for Aristotle, ultimately the divine substance of the, the first mover for Plato, ultimately the good and so on. But on the other, other hand, or the other side, contemplative knowledge is transformative for people exactly because it resituates the knower and their activity reflectively within the field of the known. In knowing contemplatively, we re-know ourselves, but not as we thought of ourselves before, as separate individuals, like branches cut off from a tree, as Marcus Aurelius says, but as participants in the larger transpersonal order which philosophizing can reveal. In the Platonist tradition, looking back to the symposium, a language of eros or love is hence central. And I think this captures a comportment towards the beloved, the object, the world, that involves both activity and receptivity. The Neoplatonist tradition will allegorically, allegorically interpret the myth of Odysseus returning after many trials to his homeland in Ithaca to to describe the ascent of the knower towards a contemplative knowledge, which is at once far distant from her ordinary egoism, Troy and the Aegean, yet most deeply intimate to her, Ithaca or home. Seneca, a Stoic, presents a homologous model, despite all of the differences at the level of metaphysics. When he writes in his letters, the soul with its greater part dwells in the place from which it descended, even as the beams radiating from the sun though reaching down to earth are there from whence they are emitted. So the soul great and holy, though it lingers with us, is still attached to its origin. It hangs from it. It looks up to it. It strives towards it. And it takes part in our affairs as a higher being. Uh, this really has a lot of resonances in uh, with neo, certain Neoplatonist ideas as well. Okay, so I'm about to finish. What I've been able to say here obviously only forms the beginning of any understanding of contemplation in the ancient philosophical traditions. It's limited not simply by time, but by the boundaries of the author's present scholarship and wider capacities. By standing on the, sh the shoulders of giants, I hope to have presented some signposts which may help others interested on their ways to a better understanding of the large and sensual indeed in one sense, arguably the largest and most central place occupied in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy by forms of theoria or contemplation. Thank you. And I'm just on 140. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Matt. Um, it looks like we already have some questions popping in. Um, I might just take the privilege here to ask a question myself. Um, just just in terms of very practical context and thinking about what you've been presenting. Um, so, so you're suggesting a really, really interesting thing about how the ancient Greeks and um, Romans may have viewed contemplation, the fundamental role. But I guess given your role kind of in the modern Stoic community, 
um, what is it that what is it that practitioners are actually doing? So what does it what does that look like? Because I guess when I think of philosophy, and perhaps this is just my view as a psychologist, you know, I tend to think of reading books and thinking about the <laughs> contents of books. So what is it sort of how does it I guess that you put this into action? Yeah. Um, in terms of what what people are doing within the modern Stoic space, so yeah, there are of course there are, there are reading groups, but there are also people doing um, various regimens of Stoic exercises. Some of these are a very what I would say kind of on the ground. I call them first responders. They're exercises which help you in particular moments of potential stress or adversity, um, and the exercises span from that kind of exercise right up to quite meditative and contemplative exercises like that view from above exercise. So um, if you have a look at, you know, the work of people at like Massimo Pigliucci or, or Don Robertson, um, they, they actually contain step by step instructions as to sitting down in a certain place, take a time to calm your mind, um, control your breathing, relax. Um, and now imagine yourself looking down upon yourself and your surrounds from, you know, 100 feet and then visualize where you are and how small you are, observe the things that are around you, and now step it up again to another level, um, and then look down again and, and see how small you are and see how your, your view has expanded. Notice the other things that you can now see, resituate yourself within that kind of um, purview. Um, so building directly on texts like Marcus Aurelius's meditations, um, we are seeing now with this this modern stoic phenomena the the, the you know the, the people are actually beginning to use these texts like seneca's natural questions but marcus aurelius's meditations epictetus's discourses seneca's letters and the particular parts in those texts where you get quite specific directions as to forms of what hutto calls spiritual exercises and some of them very very clearly are, are about reshaping your sense of where you fit in um and 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 they're they're being fostered as a way of changing a person's way of seeing themselves but also for the effects that they have in terms of producing tranquility because if you realize that you're a lot smaller in the cosmic drama than perhaps you might imagine yourself some tuesday morning it's easier to relativize the problems that you might be facing on that tuesday morning you might realize the next Tuesday they'll be gone, for example, always worth remembering, um, and so on and so forth. And as for in 50 years, well, <laughs> it's likely no one's going to remember them at all. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's definitely the reading, but there's, there's philosophizing now as exercising. Uh, and in some of the Stoic definitions, philosophy is an exercise, it's an ascesis. Uh, it's not it's not just reading books. It's not just, um, I guess, thinking. Uh, there's a question here from, uh, I believe it's Tao. Um, he says, thank you for your interesting paper. Um, his question is, where do you see the broader tradition, uh, where do you see the broader tradition having been continued in some form? So for example, um, Gautian science. Well, that's a fantastically um, deep question and Goethean science is is it's very very interesting that, that that's been mentioned because again this figure Hado who I, I I'm always always mentioning because obviously he's had a huge influence on me um uh his last book was on Goethe uh and and Goethe and one of his first essays was on Goethe and in between there's a bunch of stuff on Neoplatonism and, and Stoicism um and he sees Goethe as one of the places um in which you you find this tradition staying alive. Um, you find it in figures like Michel de Montaigne in the Renaissance or, or Petrarch, I think. You find it in, in figures um, leading up to the 18th and 19th century. You even find forms of it, I think, in philosophers like Schopenhauer and Nietzsche and in the 20th century, a figure like Albert Camus. Um, but I, I think until, until Hutto had, had uh, began to work on this and, 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 and and, and then his works were translated in the 90s. Um, the, the idea that philosophy could be uh, you know, something like a way of life or a therapeutic practice or a contemplative practice had become minoritarian very widely, um, certainly in the modern period. Um, and it's only now that we're seeing initiatives to try to somehow rethink philosophy and what that might look like and how it could, for example, fit into tertiary institutions.
that is an exception. And I'll, I'll add to that certainly the, um, as we've discussed, Matt, in the context of um, contemporary psychotherapy, there is this sort of utilization of, of um, ideas, you know, Albert Ellis, sort of one of the co-founders of, um, of cognitive behavioral therapy sort of relied heavily on works from Epictetus to sort of think about how to actually challenge dysfunctional irrational ideas, which I find to also be quite interesting. So you know, this is sort of much more recently, sort of um, 1960s, 1970s, that, that this, uh, this work was happening. Um, uh, Colin, yeah, Colin had a, a separate question um, with respect to lifestyle conditions. So he, he w was wondering whether um, contemplation was considered to be a practice that was undertaken, uh, in particular, I, I presume, with, in reference to the, the Greeks and, the, and the, um, the Romans, whether it was a practice of communities or sort of was focused on individuals and whether there was a sense of sort of, you know, community sort of providing supports for practice. Yeah. Um, again, this is a really good question. And um, there are uh, there are schools, there are ancient philosophical schools um, that have a, a community aspect and 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 um, and I think integrated um, relationships between pupils and teachers, which are quite different from those which are possible for us today. Um, that involve what Ilse Trout had owed Pierre's um, second wife called spiritual direction. Um, so, for example, the letters that Seneca writes to Lucilius are the letters not simply to a pupil, but to somebody who is kind of helping on a kind of spiritual way, a spiritual path. He's educating him in Stoic theory, but he's also they're also communicating about his state of mind, about his state of well-being, about um, certain setbacks that he experiences at different times in the, in the process, um, and so on. Um, again, you can see that some of the people who are mentioned in, in the discourses of Epictetus are clearly people who are kind of living in at the school or at least living close to the school and who are, who are uh, part of a, a philosophical community that is not simply interested in kind of, you know, dissecting um, classical texts of the Stoic heritage, although that seems to have gone on as well, but also in, in the application of, of, of Stoic principles to uh, a transformed form of life. Um, there are different schools and there are different times and in, in the Roman period, for example, someone like Seneca is not part of a school and, and the, the ways in which philosophy was carried forward did change. You get the disbansion of, 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 of most of the philosophical schools in the first century before Christ when, when Athens is basically successively um, invaded um, and ultimately um, overcome by the Romans. Some of them go to Rhodes. Um, and some of them go to Rome and some of them go to the Bay of Naples um, and there are, there's evidence that there are schools elsewhere. And then it's only again in later antiquity through Marcus Aurelius and others that the schools come back to Athens. Um, so the communal aspect is definitely not absent. Um, it'd be great to have more information about what went on inside those schools. Um, it's fair to say that as a scholar it can be frustrating because you want to know more but there's not a lot of writing about specifically how the curriculum was organised, how the day was organised. Um, but you can have a look at, for example, Orfrey's Life of Plotinus, that's a good source. Um, there's some texts by an Epicurean called Philodemus, which give you a bit of an insight into a, a philosophical community in the Bay of Naples in the first and second centuries after Christ, um, including, yeah, practices of discussion where you would, you know, you would discuss how you're going and not just, you know, how's your theory going, but how are you going as a person and you, you would be expected to disclose and to, to critique and, and to participate in, in kind of assisting others on this kind of more spiritual, I guess, um, path or existential path, we might say. Thank you for that. Um, so Phil raises an interesting question. He says, is contemplation a path of knowing? Um, an epist uh, epistemological tool, or is it something more to be understood as an aspect of being, a window into being, or are such distinctions irrelevant? I think it's kind of it's kind of both, and it's it's really interesting because I mean I'm, I'm this is one of the things I'm wrestling with with understanding what what Aristotle's talking about when he's talking about theory on, um, because <sighs> philosophizing is about searching for wisdom. It's loving wisdom. It's not being wise. Um, but Aristotle seems to talk about theory and is kind of just contemplating, uh, gazing, um, as if one were, as it were, certain of, of the, the picture was complete and one was contemplating the picture. Um, and I was just reading a, a paper by a colleague, um, Lisa Davis, who I understand might be, be speaking here later on from the Buddhist perspective, but 
um, whether it's possible to have a contemplative approach to inquiry, which I, I think is also going on, which is a kind of, you know, trying to stay open, if you like, and trying to stay observant and trying to stay present um, and, and to not leap to conclusions and to, to categorise things too quickly, which we all do. Um, certainly, I think it, it's, it's, it's the latter. The first phrase was a path of knowing. The second was something a, a sort of a, I'm not sure, something to do with being. Um, it's definitely a transformative activity. I think it's quite clear that when it's described, it's generally described in terms of divinity and, and, and blessedness and felicity. Um, and, you know, I don't, I just don't think we can just dis discount that as kind of rhetorical finery. I, I really feel that it's so recurrent that it, it has to be corresponding to some existential kind of stuff. You know, that this is obviously something that these people are experiencing. Uh, and inviting us to, to experience. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely epistemic. It's about a kind of knowing, but as you say, it, it what is interesting about it, and that was why I wanted to finish with the, I guess the subject object idea is, it's, it's kind of more than knowing insofar as we can think of knowing as just sort of standing back. Um, I know that it doesn't concern me anymore. It's more, I know and in knowing that I re-know myself. Um, and so that might be where the being idea comes in. Um, but these things get tricky, you know, and, and, and in Plato and in, in Plotinus, you get reflections, well, maybe this, there's a part of this that can't even be described in language, um, which can you know, rightly invite scepticism. But again, I think it's trying to get at some aspect which is important enough that they feel like they have to say that. Uh, and and you, you mentioned sort of this idea of sort of um, perhaps integration across ideas. And so we've got a, a question sort of to that effect. Um, so some, uh, somebody sort of quite raised the issue about um, from a, a presumed psychological perspective, I was wondering if you draw a relationship between stoic philosophy and the mentalization or metacognition literature. Uh, I was curious about how Buddhist mindfulness practices are being incorporated as models of contemplative practice intended to increase mentalization capacities across different registrations of experience. Your example of stoic practices seems to serve a similar function. I'm wondering if you have any reflections on this. I wish I knew more about the literature you were describing because I feel a little bit limited. I'm not not 100 percent sure what this term mentalization means in that specific technical technical literature. Um, can, can you? Uh, the, the way that I understand it, sort of say like per say Peter Fonagy, which um, you know, please uh, people can chime in, in the comments if, I, if I'm wrong. Um, it's sort of you know just uh, a re understanding of sort of representation of what's going on mentally for others uh, and metacognition obviously just being the awareness of awareness itself um, yes, so I think okay. it's sort of you know this there's this element of sort of understanding other people's in, in inner mental life yeah I think um, with with the stoic tradition which is the tradition that I'm most familiar with there is no doubt that metacognition um, is 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 a huge part of it you know there are there are passages to the effect of this in Epictetus where he says, well, you know, all you really need to do is, is one thing, which is kind of learn to examine your own impressions, which are impressions are what comes in through the senses, but also the impulses that you form on the basis of those impressions. Maybe I should get angry right now. Maybe I should feel desire. Maybe I should feel fear. And Epictetus says, if you want to know what Stoicism is, in, in one sense, it's, it's just metacognition. It's just becoming more aware of, of the way that we're often we often treat ourselves as if we're kind of determined by things that happen to us when in fact um between what we do and what we experience there 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 is cognition and there is the capacity to take a different attitude um and to give or withhold assent they say to particular interpretations of what's what's going on and in a sense i think the stoic practice as i understand it is Ultimately, it's going to boil down to what am I assenting to? Um, what ideas are shaping who I am? Um, and, and really shaping, you know, as in, you know, how I treat my kids, you know, <laughs> my attitude towards strangers, uh, my attitude towards distressing news. Um, it, it's definitely, um, I think, something that I, 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 I'm sure that there will be more research done on in, in, in coming times um, in terms of just the relationship between stoicism and mindfulness, the relationship between stoicism and some of these, these other psychological um, 
you know, studies of including of contemplative contemplative practices. So there's just an interesting comment I thought I would share. Um, so Catherine says, I enjoyed the concept of philosophy being a kind of exercise. I'm newer to philosophy, not formally studied in it, but it was lockdown that gave me the perspective that you don't need to travel to the antipodes for solace and to understand yourself. You can travel just as far as inwardly and learning more about yourself and the perspective of yourself in the wider world, the quote, looking from above and harnessing your emotional responses to the many external events beyond your control. Yeah, um, I think having exposure to, I mean, speaking for myself, having exposure to, I guess, stoic ideas made lockdown probably a lot easier than it otherwise would have been, certainly for me. And, um, you know, it, it, there's a sense in which, depending on how you look at stoicism, you, you could, you know, metaphorise lockdown as a certain, this would be a very negative way to metaphorise stoicism, but in a certain sense, you are relearning to look at the things that are outside of your control and to withdraw your attachments to them. Um, and obviously we all got a shock lesson in, in sort of having to, to, to withdraw from a lot of the things that we were engaging with, which were, you know, in the wider world and so on and so forth, whether, um, you know, the ancient Stoic texts include texts on how to deal with exile and exile is no problem, according to the Stoics, because you go to a different place, you can still see the sky, you can still read books, um, you can still, you know, cultivate your understanding, you can still try to, you know, be a decent human being. Um, exile is, is, is only exile from yourself, uh, and, and, and that can happen anywhere, as far as they're concerned. The true exile is, in a sense, not liking who you are and the world as it is. Um, so th thank you for that, that comment. And I mean, one of the, one of the you know, the, the odd sort of bittersweet consequences of Stoicism, of, of lockdown, I think, is from speaking to people around the world, is that there's a lot of people who got into Stoicism in lockdown, you know, um, and somebody who is, you know, 85% on board with the program, this was, this is welcome news for me. <laughs> so perhaps, perhaps if I could just ask one last pointy question, and if you are able to, if you could give me the 30-second the version of the answer. Um, <laughs> if there is one. Um, so I, 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 I've encountered sort of in the context of sort of thinking about stoicism and, and similarly sort of in the context of thinking about, you know, the, the Buddhist concept of letting go of attachment that um, or, or even sort of as we discussed, you know, the, their modern implementations in psychotherapy, you know, talking about um, ha, ha, taking a decentered or a distant stance or being more rational in our thinking. Um, it d does that mean, because I think many people sort of get this impression, does that mean you can't sort of enjoy life, that you can't participate and sort of experience pleasure? And so do, do, you, do you know what I'm saying? Because um, there is a sense of like, I oh, do. it's just yeah, all about no, being totally yeah. rational and not emotional. And some people yeah, kind of yeah. interpret that as it means, well, nothing's fun anymore. Yeah, well, the stomach is supposed to be really, really happy. The stoic is supposed to be confident that no matter what happens, fundamentally, you know, they've got the equipment and the wherewithal to, 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 to live well. So, you know, Stoic is supposed to be joyous. This is supposed to not be just sort of, you know, as I said, the lockdown image works only to a certain extent because it makes it seem very, very ne negative, right? Um, but, you know, the, the, you know, Zeno, the founder of the school, is supposed to have died laughing and to have addressed death saying, you know, why rush me when I'm coming anyway? Here's apparently his last words. Um, so it's supposed to make you supremely happy. I mean, they're great last words, right? I mean, if, if that's true, which is probable, it isn't, but uh, it, it really is supposed to be um, about a new, it, it's, it's withdrawing from one sense of being connected to the world, which they think is faulty and will lead you to be unhappy probably, to another way of connecting with the world because things that are beyond your control really are beyond your control. That doesn't mean that they're not beautiful, perhaps. It doesn't mean that they're not significant in other registers, but it does mean that if you depend on them, that you might well you know, not get a great outcome from the perspective of, of um, you know, of being happy. Um, Thank you for that. I think it's a it's, it's a great way to um, to bring the session to, the, to, to, to a close. And um, thank you so much for this thought provoking presentation. Um, and thank you to the audience for joining us. Um, please do subscribe to our newsletter to stay informed about um, this event and, and, and related things, as well as other upcoming events in this series, as well as other series hosted by the Contemplative Studies Center. Um, if you're curious to learn more about Matt's work or modern stoicism, um, please also get in touch and we're happy to, to put you in touch directly with him. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thanks for joining us.